Okay, welcome everybody to this morning's Virtual Innovation Centre session with EY. Um, today's session is going to be on the topic of evaluating exit strategy, so options, getting ready, and when is the right time to act. Um, we're very lucky to be joined today by uh, Laura Seeger, who is partner in the Capital Markets Practice practice at EY and also Luca Costanzo um, who is the assistant director in healthcare m a in the healthcare m a team at EY. Um, so today they're going to be um, discussing, um, they're going to be giving you an overview of the various exit options for shareholders of life sciences businesses, highlighting the drivers of m a activity and the impact that COVID has had on this um, and also outlining how to for life sciences m a deals such as due diligence process and other preparation considerations among other things i am sure um, and we also have some time for q a at the end um, so please feel free to pop any questions in the chat box and we will do our best to pick them up from there um, as you may have already noticed this session is being recorded um, and if you don't mind just keeping your microphones on mute throughout that would be fantastic um, that is it from me. I'm going to hand you over to Laura and I hope you all enjoy the session. Thank you. So just some quick introductions before we get into the content. Um, I'm Laura Siegert. I'm a partner in our London-based capital markets team. Um, I focus on debt and equity transactions that uh, primarily relate to the United States. Um, and as you can probably tell, I, that's where I'm from. I started my career in our US audit practice, um, but now while I serve mostly our EY audit clients, I do work with a lot of advisory clients where we're not the auditors um, on helping prepare them for a US transaction. Primarily, um, my focus is um, IPOs. I'll let Luca introduce himself. Thanks, Laura, and uh, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Luca Costanzo. I am an assistant director in the healthcare and life sciences uh, M&A team at the Y that is part of the broader corporate finance services. Uh, I have done M&A for a good part of 17 years now, and since 2018, I am exclusively focused on the sector. So we work predominantly on mid-market transactions, both on the sell side and buy side with the funder-owned business predominantly, but we do work also with uh, with private equity funds on uh, on divestment and, uh, and buy side opportunities. Um, so shall we shall we jump immediately in the in the presentation? Yep. So let me let me share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see can see my screen and the presentation. So today we we're going to touch on um, on some key uh, key teams that obviously are relevant when uh, when a business and uh, and, uh, and an owner is uh, is evaluating a potential uh, exit strategies. So we will start having a, a look on the on the general M and A market, how it did perform in 2022, what we are expecting for for the current year, and then moving on. Uh, on the on the different options that uh, that an entrepreneur might might consider when started to think about an exit and uh, how to prepare in terms of timing and key consideration uh, to to have in mind in uh, in this uh, in this process. So hopefully we can have a, a, an interactive session. So feel free to raise uh, any question uh, um, when uh, when you want. Um, so starting to look at the at the MA market obviously is uh, it's not a secret that 2022 as uh, uh, seen as registered uh, as slowdown of the of the of the MA activity and this is true across all the sector is not specific for the for the life sciences but uh, if we look at the at the specific sector uh, uh, in terms of volume, uh, uh, compared with last year, the activity was down uh, circa 27%. But the big drop was uh, in terms of uh, of deal value, where uh, um, we see that with 100 billion, uh, roughly, of uh, uh, counter value of the transaction for the entire year, this was down uh, circa 53% compared with uh, with previous year. Although in the last quarter. Uh, 
uh, we have seen that there is uh, there has been an uh, an uptick in uh, in that. Um, the year has been characterized predominantly by both on acquisition from uh, from large players, although. Uh, uh, we didn't miss uh, also some large transaction, albeit in a, in a, in a less volume compared with uh, uh, with previous periods. So if we think about the <clears throat> the, the the announced acquisition of uh, of Horizon Therapeutics by Amgen, for, for example, but also Pfizer has been quite active uh, with uh, with three acquisitions. And uh, if we look then specifically at UK, there has been the acquisition of. Uh, of Hamrit and uh, uh, and Clinigen, uh, in here. So it, it hasn't been completely a disaster, if you want, but also considering the the macroeconomic environment, um, particularly in the in the back end of the year, uh, the, it was kind of expected that this uh, this type of uh, of slowdown. Um, there is a there is a consensus uh, overall that uh, 2023 will. Uh, uh, will register uh, uh, an increase in, uh, in the in the trend. And uh, if we if we look at the key at the key themes that uh, uh, underpin this uh, um, this kind of consideration, one is the the amount of uh, five power uh, that is uh, sitting on the balance sheet of large pharma players that is available. So when I say five power, I mean the the financial resources cash that is sitting on balance sheet that is available to do acquisition. And from a PE perspective, um, obviously dry powder, there is a lot of capital that is waiting to be to be deployed. But thinking about the the, uh, uh, the pharma players in particular, uh, one of the of the key themes that uh, uh, that is uh, um, that is on the agenda is the fact that uh, obviously over the next decade there will be some uh, revenue gap across the sector uh, from uh, the expiration of patents, uh, etc. So they definitely will want to use m a also as a way to 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 fill uh, to fill that gap. And from this point of view. 2023 will be we'll see a bit of continuation of the trend from uh, the previous year in terms of uh, of bolt on acquisition with uh, some specific areas continuing to 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 drive uh, uh, most of the attention like uh, oncology or, or, or immunology for example um, another key consideration is obviously the uncertainty uh, at polit political and uh, macroeconomic level uh, obviously uh, in we know about the, the, the geopolitical situation and uh, and also the uh, uh, the inflation uh, the inflation trend that um, uh, that we have uh, that we have experienced uh, I would say that this has had an impact particularly through the valuation channel because obviously 20 the last part of 2022 and beginning of 2023 has seen a, a, a reduction in general of the of the valuation in the in the MA market, but there is still some misalignment between uh, the buyer side and the sell side uh, at um, uh, at current at current time, and uh, until this uh, misalignment persists over the next few months. Uh, there are certain type of uh, structure that will uh, uh, will uh, will attract more attention, like commercial partnership, for example. Uh, but at the same time, and maybe Laura might might offer a bit more perspective on this. Obviously, through the valuation channel, there has been a reduction also of the of the number of IPOs, and uh, I'm thinking particularly also access to public market by by biotechs, for example, that. Uh, and the counterbalance of that, obviously, that the, is that the private M&A uh, eventually deal will uh, uh, will become more attractive from that point of view until this uh, uh, this persists. Um, the other uh, uh, the other key team that will uh, play in favor of uh, a rebound of the of the M&A activity is uh, is the need also of. Uh, uh, the play to move beyond the the uh, their classic business model and innovation in the in the classic drugs product or, or medical devices we we have seen through uh, MA activity also from uh, 
left field player from the tech sector, for example, uh, that the, there is a trend in creating uh, uh, a more harmonious uh, health ecosystem. Um, so I'm thinking about acquisition uh, uh, by players like, uh, like Amazon, uh, uh, CVS Health. So there is a, a convergence of other type of uh, 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 capabilities that, uh, that go beyond the classic, uh, uh, the classic drug and uh, uh, medical device development. Uh, so in general, 2023 is expected uh, to be uh, uh, um, that will be a stronger year uh, than uh, than 2022. Um, Laura, anything to add before maybe we move to the strategic options for? Yeah, I think, you know, during the pandemic, we just saw a record number of listings in the U.S. in particular. Um, and now with a bit of the slowdown and maybe not the markets being as, um, you know, attractive to some companies, you're absolutely right that people and companies are thinking, well, I need to do something. I need to raise capital or I need to, you know, how can I further move um, my R and D or my clinical trials. So you're absolutely right. I think I think folks that perhaps were originally on a straight IPO timeline are now looking at other options, including M and A, and and I'll talk about some of the other options that companies are are being presented with. Um, but I am I am having more and more conversations in in recent months that we are seeing that desire uh, to approach the the US IPO market more and companies are getting ready for when that window does open up. So I, I can get into that more when we talk more specifically on the IPO options, but I am I am pleasantly seeing um, more companies and and talking with banking institutions that 23 will be kind of the turnaround year. Thanks, Laura. Um Moving on to the agenda, let's see what are the effectively the the, uh, the options that a, a, a business owner might have in front of uh, uh, of her him when uh, when considering an exit. So the obviously the the natural default option uh, in reality is uh, remaining invested in the business and continuing to grow be, uh, because that's uh, that's also an option that. Uh, uh, usually is uh, kind of forgotten, uh, but it's uh, it's there. Uh, I think when evaluating uh, uh, the, the the exit versus the remaining invested, the, the key uh, key things to consider are obviously the opportunity cost of uh, the potential lower growth trajectory. So the key question uh, uh, in this regard is: uh, Are there grow opportunities that the business is missing because of the of the limitation of the lack of uh, of resources so that requiring opening the capital or, or, or a partnership and the other uh, important element is uh, is obviously the, the the personal horizon of the of the entrepreneur or if there are multiple shareholders the the, the alignment of their uh, uh, of their personal uh, personal horizons um uh, I think this is important to highlight because uh, when considering exit the business, obviously it's not an overnight decision, but to need to be carefully planned and prepared well in advance. Um, and uh, because there are a number of, uh, of things to consider and, and, and prepare before effectively going, uh, going live on the market. Uh, but in terms of, uh, <clears throat> Effective transaction. So, the, uh, from an academic perspective, we tend to uh, divide the, the the two macro options with uh, uh, between uh, a PE venture capital type of deal or a trade sale. So, to a, a strategic uh, strategic type of bias, and uh, and we will talk then uh, uh, immediately after. Uh, well, actually, Laura will talk uh, about the IPO. So. What are the, the key difference or, or commonalities between uh, between these two elements? So uh, a PVC type of deal is normally considered to be a, a way of uh, partially cash out from the business. So in a way, they risk the entrepreneur position and uh, uh, in terms of concentration of uh, the world in, uh, in the business. And at the same time, maintaining the uh, 
potential upside from uh, from the future growth because uh, a, a, um, the entrepreneur will still remain uh, partially invested in uh, in the business it will work along the the financial partner in uh, in continuing to grow it so when uh, thinking about a partnership like uh, like this one uh, obviously things to have very clear in mind are the the achievability of the plan and the commitment of the of the of the funder and the manager in uh, in delivering that growth plan the fact that there will be inevitably a loss of control and uh, there will be a higher requirement in terms of reporting sharing strategic decisions with the with the partners uh, etc and at some point there will be uh, potentially also a divergence of interest between uh, uh, between the uh, the founder of the business and uh, and the financial partner that uh, will have uh, roughly speaking a medium term horizon normally speaking in the 3 or 5 years for vc might be might be longer so when thinking about going through this uh, through this direction is uh, is important to have that that clarity that these um, these things will need to be to be addressed uh the sale to a strategic player instead of the uh, the trade sale is uh, my my happen in uh, in uh, in different structures so you might have the the full complete full exit so full sale to a trade player so um in this way uh, basically the, the the entrepreneur obviously uh, take money off the table completely there might still be some upside from some earn out mechanism but typically there is no upside from from the longer term growth of the business or there might also be um uh, uh, the opportunity to plug basically the the product of the business into uh, a strategic platform and still remaining invested so from this point of view, uh, this type of structure might be more similar to a PEVC type of deal in the sense that the entrepreneur obviously remain invested and uh, uh, there is the potential upside from uh, uh, the, the continuing of the, of the growth of, uh, of the business. Uh, the key differential point is obviously is the is the horizon because obviously a strategic player doesn't have the same type of mid-term horizon like uh, like a private equity so in this regard it's important from uh, uh, from a shareholder perspective uh, understanding what is his personal horizon because you need to have clear in mind also what might be further down the line uh, the the full exit for the op, the options for the full exit from the business um when considering uh, uh this type of structure so more like partnership or plugging in a larger strategic platform so key consideration are obviously uh a reverse type of due diligence because uh, the, the the seller will receive maybe shares in the in the larger platform in the larger business absorbing his own business but also the the fit in terms of culture strategy and um and uh, as i said before the the future options eventually to to, to monetize fully um Looking at these uh, at these options that are uh, that are shown on the screen, the the first two obviously remaining invested in uh, in a financial type of deal, normally speaking, are considered as uh, 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 as the interim steps toward uh, an exit that might be realized through uh, through an IPO as well. And uh, Laura, I don't know if you have uh, more uh, more perspective thoughts to share on uh, on that as well. Yeah, I think what we what we typically see, which is I think fairly standard in a growth company um, timeline, is is just to do some internal funding rounds before being ready to enter the public market. Obviously, especially in the U.S., which I focus on, um, entering into that regulatory market is a big step. So um, we're we're going to talk about a little bit in the next slides on you know, what are companies doing to be prepared for that? But we're, you know, we're absolutely seeing some interim steps um, to just kind of make sure that the journey to IPO is in the right timeline. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
let's move now on to what the preparation phase might, uh, might look like. Because uh, <clears throat> as we said before, the, the, uh, the exit plan is something that needs to be carefully prepared and uh, planned and, and executed uh, as well. Because obviously uh, the key objective uh, is uh, uh, maximizing the, the the value obviously of uh, of the exit and achieving also the 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 objective of the uh, of the um, of the seller uh i think the the key messages that we we are we we would like to alight to this slide is uh, where we have seen more often than not things going wrong effectively so common traps basically uh, uh, that uh, then see this planning failing to achieve the uh, the expected objectives one is uh, prioritizing the minimization of the of the timetable actually over the the value maximization so try to accelerate in an unsustainable way the uh, go to market uh, without a, a careful preparation and this is uh, a common way of uh, failing to achieve those uh, uh, those objectives that uh, were at the very at the very base of the of the decision, but uh, other things that uh, uh, require a careful preparation are obviously the the uh, development plan of uh, of the business. So making sure that that is uh, credible, achievable, underpinned by sustainable uh, metrics and assumption, but also the commitment of the manager in. in uh, uh, the possibility to deliver uh, a challenging uh, development plan that uh, underpins uh, uh, a compelling equity equity story. Um, we have talked about uh, um, accelerating uh, um, uh, accelerating too much, effectively the, the the preparation the preparation phase and going to market uh, too soon uh, without maybe addressing some. Uh, issues that there might be at uh, different level operations or legals or, or, or tax or, or, or others. So key question are, are, is the legal structure, for example, of the of the business, the right one in this moment to go on the market or is the, the, the potential tax liability arising from uh, from the sale, uh, uh, it's possible to, to manage that liability, minimize the the, the value leakage from uh, uh, from tax uh, liability, uh, etc. So uh, the uh, the planning and uh, and uh, the planning and, and uh, of of this phase before going to the market definitely help to address uh, as many as possible of these potential issues that. Uh, uh, further down the line may may have a negative impact on the on the value creation from uh, from the exit and <clears throat> moving uh, moving on this same line so this slide is uh, is mainly aimed to to um, summarizing basically key question that uh, that the business owner might might ask when uh, when uh, preparing during this uh, this phase and uh, planning for uh, for the exit so uh, some of this we we have already touched before, so uh, uh, I won't go um, to repeating uh, to repeating them. Um, valuation is obviously uh, is obviously a key point to 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 consider, and uh, depending on uh, where the business uh, sits in uh, in uh, in the life cycle. Uh, obviously, as an impact on the on the valuation that might achieve on the on the market, and and also uh, the the interest that it might trigger from different type of uh, of buyers or, or or investors. So, from this point of view, the timing of of, the, of that decision and of the exit plan is uh, is important from from this point of view. Uh, the other factor, uh, obviously, impacting valuation is the is the grow in terms of uh, track record uh, and uh, and um, an history of uh, of the business that might drive uh, a premium valuation. But uh, having said that, obviously, even in the case of uh, uh, pre-revenue or pre-commercialization type of business, that doesn't mean that. Uh, 
uh, the assets themselves have, uh, have no value uh, because there are no, no financial trajectory of, of the ground because uh, there are still uh, IP data set, et cetera, that might have uh, a strategic value, but also monetary monetary value. So <clears throat> then <coughs> that will, um, uh, uh, will be affected particularly by other consideration uh, in terms of uh, where specifically in, uh, in um, in the market, the uh, the business sits in uh, in which area? Because there are some areas, for example, that uh, are uh, perceived like a higher value. Thinking about uh, orphan drugs, rare disease type of businesses, this uh, is focused on on oncology. Uh, more recently, uh, uh, data driven business, uh, etc. So that is th that kind of of nuance then within uh, uh, within uh, the sector. Um, and the the last point is uh, is about uh, uh, is about the DMNA process that kind of reinforced the previous message about the the preparation of uh, uh, of of um, of the plan of the exit plan. Having a smooth and efficient and well managed M and A process definitely will have an impact on the value that the the seller will be will be able to achieve, and to reinforce this, obviously, preparation of this is key in order to 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 achieve that uh, that goal. Can I hand over to to you to talk about uh, about yeah. the IPO value journey? Yeah, and Luca, you mentioned something on that previous slide that I think is really important in an IPO situation yeah. as well, and that's that timing concept. So yeah. anytime I'm talking with, with my clients or someone who's looking to do a US IPO and they say, well, when, you know, when would when do you think would be good timing? I, you know, it really does come down to do you have um, that equity story? Do you have a data readout that is going to change that equity story whereby um, it's going to be extremely valuable information to have um, because you've got, you know, a positive readout? So I think that it underpins probably the timing um, for most of my life science and biotech clients um, on, on when they would go. So um, Moving on to then this next timeline slide, um, I'm not going to go through all the points here, but I think what I what we wanted to talk about today is just making sure that good preparation is extremely important on on a whole variety of levels. Um, I think there was a time a few years back when the market was so hot that. Um, you know, companies just wanted to go and they wanted to go in eight weeks. And some advisors would say, absolutely sure, you know, we can take you through it in eight weeks. And I just advise on, hold on, don't get don't get too excited that all IPOs can be done in, in eight weeks. There is some significant prep that needs to be thought through and making sure that you've lined up the right advisors. Um, me sitting on more of the accounting and finance side, I never want the financial statements, for example, to be the blocker of a company wanting to list at the appropriate time. So really thinking through, okay, right, if I wanna go in 2024, what could I be doing now to get some of the historical information done, audited, and in a format that's gonna be accepted by, in this case, the SEC in the United States. Um, so you know, what could we be doing now to just get some of that effort, um, which you know, is, is, can be quite substantial, out of the way whereby when the full working group is is compiled, so that's bankers, SEC attorneys, um, underwriters counsel, we're not talking about a moving target with the financial statements. It is really, okay, how are we gonna market this? What do we wanna put in the registration statement? What is the equity story? Um, you know, and really work towards that timeline. So I really encourage anybody who's thinking of going in the next 12 to 18 months of having just that thought process of what, what could I be doing now that would, would impact, you know, and, and provide a benefit for the future. Um, and then I would also encourage you to think about, right, when I become a public company, you know, what, what does my function need to look like? That's, that can be any, anything from, finance and accounting to investor relations to legal and to, into tax you know what what is the new company now that i'm going to be a publicly listed entity and of, of course there's costs associated with that so making sure you know 
the IPO raise and listing is, is a, is a one day event and it's extremely exciting. And, um, I love taking companies through it, but you know, there is a obligation going forward that's got regulatory scrutiny associated with it. So are you ready to operate in that environment as well? So it's just kind of having that step back to say, is the timeline that I want to become a public company, are we fit for purpose? What do we need to enhance? What do, you know, what consultants do we need to bring in? What what positions in my organization do I need to permanently fill in order to be able to say, yes, I am ready to be a public company? Right, so, yeah. I, yeah, thank, thanks, Laura. I think this cover the, the, the key concepts that we wanted to align that there are a couple of final pages about how uh, how we operate in the in, in the sector with to differentiate the, uh, the, probably the the uh, the two key points to highlight here as one is uh, <clears throat> the breadth of uh, our uh, expertise and, and also compared with uh, with other uh, uh, with other players on the market we really uh, have a, a suite of expertise across the m a legal tax uh, uh, and strategy um so that can uh, uh, I always uh, I'm used to say that uh, I I rarely find myself in the in the situation where I don't find someone in Hawaii that has an answer. <laughs> it's uh, given the the, the the breadth of expertise. So that's the definitely that's a uh, uh, that's a, a a clear strength. And then uh, this slide to give the idea how life sciences is a, is an important sector for us. And what I like here particularly is the fact that uh, we have the 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 expertise that allow us to work with the, both big names, but also mid market and lower mid market companies. Uh, and really, the, that's the beauty of having this. Uh, uh, this uh, 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 large set of, uh, of capabilities and, uh, and expertise in house. Uh, and I think that there are a couple of valuation data points uh, in the background. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, I'm going to open the floor now to our audience. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to pop these in the chat box. Um, so just one for me to, to kind of kick things off. When you're first approached by um, a life sciences company, what are the kind of most common initial questions and maybe challenges or fears that they're, they're, they're facing initially when they approach you? Luca, I can take that from a IPO perspective if you yeah, want. Yeah, <laughs> so when a when a company has decided, um, a lot of times most most of my clients do a dual track approach. So they ultimately want to do an IPO. Peer groups are, you know, often NASDAQ listed in the United States, but should that not, you know, be the best path or, you know, perhaps clinical trials or maybe data readout is just so far down the line, they usually dual track with some sort of trade sale option as well. So my, I think the number one question I get is what can I be doing um, in order to prepare where I can use those efforts in either scenario. Um, so depending on, you know, just taking it from a financial statement perspective, you know, what, what options do I have? that would benefit me, whether I could do an IPO, whether I do a trade sale. If the IPO is, is the path forward, um, then it's it's thinking, you know, how how can I be starting to compile that information, get it audited by the by my auditors in order to put it in the registration statement? That's probably the second thing that that I talk through with companies. And then the third thing is what what do we need to think of to enhance kind of the internal control element of the company? So that can be governance that can be entity level that can be you know what procedures policies do I need to get in place because being in that public environment um, you know that's where the entrepreneurial spirit we love it but at the same time things need to be documented and more formalized um, when becoming a publicly registered company so those are probably the three buckets that I speak to clients about 
um, everybody always wants to know, you know, when, when, when do you think the timing is going to be great? When do you think the market's opening? And I, I don't have a crystal ball with that, but, but I am hearing, I'm getting the question more now for preparation to maybe start the filing process, um, you know, Q4 of this year to become a listed company in the first half of 2024 versus last year, I felt companies were saying, Hey, we're just waiting the IPO timeline is 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 completely put on pause. Those conversations are starting to come back now. So I do feel like there will be some sort of turn coming. Um, the U.S. election in November of 2024 will be an interesting one because some companies may want to, you know, that could dictate a window. Um, so, you know, if it opens up for the early part of the year, does that mean it's going to quickly close again by the election? I mean, we're just going to have to wait and see. Yeah, Man. and from yeah, from my point of view, they're working predominantly with the mid market or mid market. The, the key to question uh, more often than not about the the right time and uh, uh, what size is uh, is the one to go, uh, the right one to go on the market. Uh, to be honest, there is no uh, black and white answer on uh, on that. Uh, again, it uh, it really it's back to the 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 objective of uh, of uh, of the seller and where we sit, particularly in the and the market uh, and the market dynamics. Um, but yeah, there, there are. I'm thinking about some of the conversation I had with uh, with some potential clients that have products or services that. Uh, have not yet exploited fully the, basically their potential in terms of uh, uh, of commercial and, and sales, et cetera. And that's the kind of uh, of, um, of thinking uh, in, in the seller mind, if that's the, the right moment or they should continue to grow, invest a bit more. Uh, so normally at the very beginning, those are the kinds of doubts <laughs> that we are asked about. Great, thank you. Um, and I can see we've got a few um, questions coming in. So thank you um, to those. So there's one from Abel and that's, um, you mentioned 24 to 30 months prep uh, execution for an IPO. Uh, what is the timeline for a trade sale M&A approach as opposed to IPO? Yeah, so uh, the M&A process itself. So let's say from the moment in which the the seller push the green button and say, okay, I wanna uh, I wanna kick off the process until the end. Uh, on average, it takes in between everything in between in the six and nine months. So the execution process in itself, although in the last uh, year or so this has been uh, uh, stretched a bit more, uh, there are. There are a number of deals that uh, more often than not goes also beyond the 12 months because of the particular uh, situation where we are in uh, in the market. Uh, but this doesn't take into account the six to nine months window doesn't take into account obviously the the preparation. So uh, that the length of that period might, might also well be in uh, 18, 24 months or, or even shorter depending on how ready the business is in terms of uh, the uh, organizational structure, uh, sustainability of the level of performance. So, for example, if you have a number of years of uh, flattish or, or uh, minor growth, and then you have an excellent year, uh, suddenly, obviously, you wanna you, you wanna start to show first that that level of performance now it become consistent and sustainable. So you need at least another year of track record uh, uh, showing that uh, in order to build your uh, your equity story, etc. So that preparation phase, uh, I will say, might go between one and two year, depending on where the business is. Brilliant. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Laura, at all? No, I think that's, I mean, consistent. You know, like I said, I think making sure that you've got the right timeline and not having anyone push you into that timeline that feels uncomfortable. So um, I say ideally 18 to, or 12 to 18 months for an IPO. Can it be done shorter? Sure. Um, but just making sure that, you know, entering in the public environment, you just want to make sure you're ready. Brilliant. Um, thank you. 
And there's another question here. So how will a lack of PCAOB audited financials affect the timeline for an IPO? So that's a great question. Um, the SEC will not accept a um, filing that is not that does not have financial statements in line with the PCOB audit. So um, it's important to, let's say if you're gonna go in 2024, if, you're, if you meet the requirements of a, of a smaller reporting company or an emerging growth company, you would only need two years going into that, into that registration statement. So you're looking at now, you know, 2023 and 2022, depending on when you go. Um, so I would be talking to your auditors now about what they can be doing to get those PCOB audit procedures done, at least to the extent where it's very minimal once you know your timeline. Um, from my audit experience, um, especially with pre-revenue biotech and life science companies, it's, it's two things that uplift to a PCOB audit. It's auditing to a lower materiality, so sampling and what is material um, just requires more uh, work that needs to be done because there are guidelines in the, in, in the industry that say we need to audit down to a lower threshold. So that's the first effort. And then the second effort, there's just more documentation um, around the related parties and some other areas that the SEC is focused on that we have to then put into our files. So there's more effort on gathering that documentation um, so we can issue a PCOB opinion. But it is a really good question because again, I would hate for the audit to dictate your timing. So the more of those procedures that you can bring forward, have those discussions with your auditors, I think it will be, it'll greatly benefit you um, and probably take some pressure out of the timeline. Brilliant. Luca, is there anything you'd like to add? We've got a couple more questions coming in. No. No. Fab. Perfect. No, so, I'm, I'm... Oh. <laughs> awesome. So, um, what options are available for a biotech uh, with promising assets at the preclinical level? A short cash runway, six to twelve months, not ready for M and A or IPO. Great question. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the the first thing that uh, uh, that came to mind is uh, is definitely the fundraising uh, from uh, from a private investor. Um, because I assume that the the the, um, uh, the question when we speak about M and A, we uh, we're thinking about uh, about sale M and A. So fund, I will consider fundraising uh, something uh, not included in uh, the in the M and A in the question. Uh, so that's definitely definitely an option. You have to find obviously the right type of investor that is comfortable uh, investing um, at that level of early stage in the in the development phase. There is there is actually a, an interesting uh, data point that was not shown in uh, in the slides that uh, last year more than fifty percent of uh, the investments. Uh, um, in the acquisition were uh, in uh, products that were pre phase three of the of the clinical development that, that was for the first time since uh, uh, internally we are we are monitoring those uh, those kind of data that is quite interesting because it's a uh, it's a uh, it's evidence of how the from a buyer perspective they are trying to position themselves as early as possible in the in the development uh, in the development uh, funnel uh, in order to to um, uh, in order to uh, to buy or, or or invest and uh, and fill those gaps that we we mentioned before. So definitely there is appetite to, to invest at that stage uh, and uh, and then invest on my might be might be fun. The other option is obviously having a, a personal investor type of of of, of other of other funding. And 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 I'll just quickly, um, if if a traditional IPO for whatever reason is not, you know, the short term answer, we are seeing. Um, SPACs and reverse mergers um, also being kind of back on the table. Um, 
it may shorten a little bit the runway versus an IPO. However, the requirements that are needed are often quite similar. So the effort, again, on what needs to be prepared to go into those, because you, you are doing registration statements typically with those as well. Um, you know, the, the requirements don't necessarily go away, um, but it can be a shorter way um, to get cash. Yeah, and sorry to uh, on to add on that. I wouldn't discount also the 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 possibility of uh, when we mentioned in uh, during the the illustration of the deck about the uh, partnership with the uh, with the strategic player or plug plugging the products basically in a in a strategic platform that because that can give access not not only to financial resources but exactly to those type of strategic resources that you need in order to develop further. The 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 uh, the product, so that definitely is another option that is worth uh, being considered. That's a good point. I have a lot of companies that that is their bridge financing um, in order to make sure that they can get to the right window. Absolutely. Thank you. So we have another question. Um, I assume many companies wanting to list or seek VC funding and attain certain targets may underestimate the resource required to grow or reach those funding milestones. So how do EY handle such potential disagreements with the client? D so disagree is it disagreements on the resourcing? Is that what it was? Or the support needed for those? Is that? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, the, um, the amount of resource required, yeah. Yeah, so um, when I'm on the audit side, so I'm very limited into my my audit hat or my audit responsibilities, I, I typically encourage my, my, com my companies that I'm working with to get some sort of advisory support, even if that is um, temporary, just to have, because I just, I do think there's a bandwidth issue. Um, there are boutique firms that can help in certain areas, obviously all the big four um, can help. We we have a lot of advisory work that we do where, you know, we bring all aspects of the firm together. But what's nice about that is when you do list, let's say, you, you continue to have that support. So it's not like your advisory firm falls away, but you can do it in a way that, you know, can perhaps, you know, you, your reliance on, on advisors kind of wean down as you build up that finance function. So the I think the challenging bit is trying to find that balance. So companies before the listing probably won't want to build up their internal function to the at, to the respect that they will want when they're a public company, but just making sure that you've got that support to get you through the process. And then, you know, as you build that team, as you build the resources you need, you know, especially from an internal control perspective, you can do that over the time that it takes, but you'll still have that support from advisors. I rarely see companies not bring in some sort of advisory arm or, or advisory firm. And again, it really comes down to that bandwidth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yep. All right, have we got any more questions for the chat box? So you shared some really great advice today, but I'm just wondering if you could give maybe like one very key takeaway that you would kind of shout from the rooftops to these companies, what would that be? So I think, I, I think I've already said it, don't us, underestimate the effort that goes into it because when when listing in the US, you want you want the SEC and the investor community to recognize that you're ready, ready to be a listed company in the US. So um, you just you just want to be um, seen as part of that that peer group that's already listed. So just don't underestimate that that effort. But I think I I've probably said that a few times already. <laughs> it's a fun yeah. process though. I enjoy doing it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I echo what, uh, what Laura said. From from an M&A perspective, uh, I think uh, uh, probably building up on that is uh, do not underestimate the the uh, actually the help and contribution that uh, uh, that an advisor can uh, can bring to 
uh, uh, to plan that uh, that important stage. And uh, I think that uh, when uh, when when choosing the type of of support of assistance, that uh, um, uh, my suggestion is uh, try to understand really the expertise of uh, that advisor, the knowledge about the the market, the sector, uh, uh, the key players, and access to that. Uh, and let do not focus only maybe on the on the more hardcore and uh, and and financial uh, financial metrics because that can make the difference so for the success of the of the MA process. Brilliant, thank you. And we've had another question come in. Um, how important is news flow to the success of an IPO? News flow as far as in internal developments uh, associated with the products, is that? Yes, okay. Um, very important. I think that helps get the excitement, not only of the, the company, um, you know, why perhaps you're a differentiator in the market, why should investors invest in you versus another biotech? Um, but I also think the timing of that is really important, especially because in the run-up to an IPO, um, it's very important that what you're saying in your registration statement needs to align with perhaps something that you've already publicly announced or something that is going to be publicly announced. And your SEC attorneys will help you navigate kind of that timeline to make sure that you don't over over communicate something that then, you know, in the registration statement either changes or um, is said in a different way. So I do think news flow is extremely important. I think um, it, it definitely helps, um, you know, get the excitement behind the IPO, which will therefore um, dovetail into, you know, how much is being being able to be raised. Thank you, Chris. Anything you'd like to add on that? Okay, well, we have a few more minutes left. Are there any kind of final questions? Um, no. Wonderful. Well, I just want to say another big thank you, Luca and Laura, for your time today. It's been a really interesting a session. Um, and of course, to EY for helping to pull this together. Um, and um, yeah. With the session being recorded, we'll make sure that it's um, circulated after the session. And um, thank you again to everybody for joining. It's been, um, yeah, really interesting. And we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.